Matt ruled of the Panthers, but Joe Judge blew his press conference away. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Giants Brawl Podcast brought to you by the Brawl Network. As always, I'm your host, Usaid Koshal. You can follow me on Twitter at Usaid Koshal. And then I'm joined by Anthony Rivardo. You can follow him on Twitter at Anthony underscore Rivardo. We've had an eventful week. We guys hope you... Your week is going great, too. We're excited, though, because first things first, Anthony, you got to ask you, man, how you doing today? I'm doing great. I am feeling inspired and excited by Joe Judge and his awesome introductory press conference. I think he absolutely killed it. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, it's interesting because I put that Twitter poll out um, with four different options, like thoughts on the Joe Judge hiring. I was like, love it, hate it, I'm 50-50. Or Giants just totally messed up. And 50% of people said that they were actually 50-50. Well, 36.4% of people were like, oh, yeah, I hate it. But I think, like, when I caught some of the highlights of the press conference today, it was awesome because, like, last week, you know, or the last couple of weeks on the podcast, we've talked about how Matt Rule would be an outside-the-box hiring because he's a guy that can motivate his players. And we know that Rule blew his press conference out of the water in Carolina, too. But, like, Joe Judges was just so much better than I expected. And I think now it's, like, just optimism's in the air in New York. Yeah, and I'll admit, I was one of the people that voted 50-50 on the Twitter poll. Because when they hired him, it really came as a surprise to me. I didn't think that he was a very serious candidate for them. I didn't think he was receiving a lot of consideration. I did a lot of research on Matt Rule and his potential uh, offensive staff, too. And I did a lot of research on Mike McCarthy and Don Martindale. But I really didn't research Joe Judge. So I was very confused. Didn't know uh, what to make of the hiring. But after I dug in, I did my research, obviously seeing that he was from the Nick Saban and then the Bill Belichick coaching tree. There's a lot to like here about Joe Judge. He's a very discipline-oriented and detail-oriented head coach, and I, I think he's going to do great things for the Giants. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned the ties to uh, Saban and Belichick, and that's awesome because it's like this is a guy that's been mentored and worked under two of the arguably best football coaches in this generation and he's done it at both levels and you know there's a lot of quotes that stuck out to me and a lot of the stuff that like joe judge said was like you know what there's going to be a legitimate lack of accountability right now beginning at this moment that you would not think was there during the Shermer era right like there's one quote He's like, oh, we don't care where you're drafted or if you're traded for, you want to stay on the field, earn it. If not, you won't be on the field. And I think that that's the type of quote that like is getting ready to tell a young team that, hey, nothing easy is going to come in this league. You want to win, you're going to have to earn those wins because no one's going to give it to you. Yeah, that was one of my favorite quotes because it was such a night and day difference between Shermer and Joe Judge because Pat Shermer towards the end of the season was making a lot of excuses about a uh, historically young team and uh, many things about how there's a lot of practice squad players on this team. And it sounded like he was honestly making excuses, but Joe Judge has made it clear from the get-go that he doesn't care where you were drafted or where people think that you should be. And he's going to expect nothing but the best from you and try to get the best that he can out of you. And that's a really refreshing take to hear from a Giants head coach. Yeah, and I, I think like... I love him saying that, and the biggest reason being is because, like, the Patriots are a prime example of just, you know, finding guys on, like, day three undrafted free agents and then just turning those guys into something. And so this is a guy you know he's been a part of an organization that knows how to extensively scout talent, and he's like, look, I'm bringing the Patriots way here. It may not be the exact carbon copy of it, but um, we're going to do everything that we can to ensure we put the best product on the field. And I think even Giants ownership said something like, yeah, this is, you know, this guy just blew us out of the water in the interview. Yeah, and it's easy to see why, because the way that he was speaking in that press conference, he really commands the room. Um, he's very articulate with the way that he speaks, and you, you want to hear what he has to say. And you know, I've fallen asleep listening to Pat Shermer and Ben McAdoo talk sometimes. They were boring and redundant, and they didn't have anything inspiring to say. So, like I said, it's been it's a huge change of pace, and it's very refreshing. And I, I'm starting to really believe in Joe Judge. I, I, I really like what he's brought to the table so far. Yeah, and you know, just this is a second quote that I dug up, right, that I think is really just shows the kind of coach that he's going to be. He's like, look. 
what I learned from Coach Belichick is real simple. Be flexible with your personnel. Don't try to shove square pegs in a round hole. Figure out what you have. And I think, like, right there, what he's basically saying is, look, we're not just going to draft anyone or anyone that's on the team and try to sort of fit them into, like, what we believe is going to work. No, we're going to look at every player that we have, all 53 guys on the 53 man roster 46 of them which are going to dress for game day and we're going to figure out where to you know put you guys we're going to figure out how to put you guys in a position to excel on the field and i think like that's a great quote because you never saw that in the uh Shermer years yeah and i'll say that quote stuck out more than any quote to me I, that was by far my favorite quote and that's one when, when i was listening to this press conference when I heard that, I really felt confident in Joe Judge because, you know, over the past two years, we've seen Dave Gettleman and this coaching staff with Pat Shermer and James Betcher. So many Cardinals, ex-Cardinals players, ex-Panthers players being hired, be, uh, being signed because they fit in the scheme. And it's it was clear that they were leaving talent in free agency and going with scheme familiar guys rather than getting the talented players and building the scheme around the players. You know, and that's something that we've seen with the top teams like the Seahawks and the Patriots, where they found a lot of success focusing on what the player is good at and not what they can't do, but focusing on what they can do and how to make them do it to the best of their abilities. And I think DK Metcalf is an excellent example of that. A lot of teams focus on what he can't do because of his bad agility times at the combine and he fell in the draft. But the Seahawks had enough um, wisdom to realize what he can do. He can do really well. So if we draft him and maximize that, we can get great things out of him, and he just set a receiving record for a rookie in the playoffs. And this is something that the Giants have really lacked, like I said, just hiring players because they fit a scheme. And now, hopefully, they're going to start building a scheme around the talent that we have on the roster, and that should, that should you know, turn into much better outcomes than we've had. It should be night and day difference. Yeah, and, you know, I think um, what's just so interesting about all this is it's like I labeled Matt Rule kind of an outside-the-box hire uh, a couple weeks ago, obviously. Like I said, we discussed him extensively on this podcast and why he was the right fit. But I feel like Joe Judge could actually end up being a much better hire than Matt Rule because, like, he's worked under Bill Belichick and Nick Saban, like we just mentioned. And from day one, you know, his press conference just wasn't about motivation. It was also about showing that, look, I'm here. All right. I'm going to command the room, but we're also going to do things in a different way that is has not been done here before. Yeah. And I'm not going to pretend like I wasn't really uh, supportive of Matt Rule. And I was honestly a little bit disappointed when I found out, you know, Matt Rule was going to the Panthers and. You know, for a second, it seemed like we were going to end up with Jason Garrett, and that was pretty terrifying. But, you know, I was disappointed because I was a big fan of Matt Rule after doing all the research on him. I thought that he was, you know, a good leader, and he, he built some pretty great college programs. And I think he's going to do great things in Carolina. But at the end of the day, that seven-year commitment, that is a big commitment, especially for a team that just went through two coaches in four years. To try and commit to another coach for seven years, that's very difficult. I, I can't really blame the Giants for not being able to make that commitment. And while I do think he's going to do great things in Carolina, I think Joe Judge is an even more out-of-the-box hiring, and I think that the potential is there to be an even better hiring than Matt Rule would have been. Uh, I think Joe Judge, very out-of-the-box and lots of potential. Right, and I think like the biggest thing that people need to understand the NFL is in today's NFL, it's like all about taking risks and kind of just like swinging for the fences. And I think when you do something like swing for the fences like the Giants did here with Joe Judge, I think it's something that is going to, you know, it really has the potential to pay off because this is a phenomenal hire. Now, granted, like, look, here's the thing. Let's just say, hypothetically, the Giants commit to Matt Rule for seven years and $60 million, right? That's bad because the thing is, is that you really only get, as an NFL head coach, like, three three years at max now to be able to prove that like you belong you know and so the giants right we don't know the contract details for joe judge but um they're kind of taking things in a different direction i think that if anything like you got to give credit to the front office and ownership here for kind of thinking the way that they did you know because there's a hell of a lot of candidates that they could have gotten but they went with the one that felt like would really modernize this franchise yeah, and I think one of the things that came into the decision-making um, was a major factor is 
obviously the job security of Dave Gettleman. Um, you know, he even thought that he was going to be fired. He said that in his end of the season press conference. And, you know, Gettleman, he's got a lot of supporters. He's got a lot of people who are definitely against him. Uh, I kind of stand somewhere in between. But besides that, um, it is hard to commit to a coach really long term when you're not even all the way committed to your general manager. And you don't want to get stuck committed to your coach for seven years when you're only committed to your general manager on a year-to-year basis. So uh, that definitely had to play uh, into the decision-making. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, what's going to be interesting is how do Gettleman and Joe Judge go about this offseason? Because what you have is a guy that's worked in front offices for multiple years. This is his second stint for Gettleman as a GM, was previously in Carolina. And then now you have a guy that's a first-time head coach. It's not like Joe Judge was like a – a coordinator, you know, there's a guy that was a position coach just three weeks ago, and now all of a sudden he's a head coach. And so, how are these guys' philosophies going to line up on draft day? And I think when you look at it, like we, so we talked about last week, all about the what they should do with the fourth overall pick. And now I think you look at it, they're the Giants are going to have that 36th overall pick in the 2020 draft, and that's I think going to be another interesting selection because. We talked hypotheticals, right? You go with Andrew Thomas at number four overall, or you could trade back and accumulate extra draft picks like the third rounder that Gettleman gave up for Leonard Williams, which is another reason why me and you have such a love-hate relationship with him. Mm. But um, that second overall pick, right, what need would you want to see them address there if they were to just stand pat? Well, see, it really it is obviously predicated on what they do with the fourth overall pick, but I, I really do like the idea of getting an impact defensive player at number four, whether that be Isaiah Simmons, Jeffrey Okuda, or maybe even on the offensive side of the ball. Jerry Judy is a fantastic talent, and I think that 36 overall pick, the second round pick, that's a perfect place to grab an offensive tackle. There is quite a number of solid offensive tackles in this draft class, and I think that maybe they could get you know a really solid guy in the second round. Yeah, definitely. I agree. I think, like, you know, you're going to have to— Nate Solder's not the future on this line. Okay. I think, like, really— So there's two guys on this line right now that stick out to me as, like, for sure being the future um, on the offensive line. And Will Hernandez and John Halapio, those are the two. I think Solder's not the future, and you can move on from him for, like, $8 million, correct? Uh, yeah, somewhere around there. You can save about $8 million. I think there's a pretty uh, pretty large dead cap hit of about $6.5 million, though. So, you know, let's just assume you move on from Nate Solder and then you draft a guy. Um, one guy I think Giants fans should really know early on would be um, Mekai Becton, the offensive tackle from Louisville. I mean, he's a really interesting guy because whenever I watched Louisville all throughout 2019, it was like, oh, this guy's big but he just moves so well and kind of brings like a nastiness to the position that uh, has not been seen in a long time. Yeah, um, I can't say that I know too much about him. Um, I do know Andrew Thomas is going to be a name that a lot of Giants fans are going to look at at the number four pick. And I know there's a lot of great receivers in this draft class, and you're definitely going to see a lot of first-round talents fall into the second round. And that could also be where they address that position. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, right? So that um, fourth, oh, I'm sorry, 36th overall pick, 36th overall pick, right? I think you could even go ahead and get a guy like um, Curtis Weaver there. I think that's going to be a really interesting guy from Boise State, edge rusher to keep an eye on. And then you can kind of have like Zimenez and Curtis Weaver go at it because you're obviously missing out on Chase Young, but I think Weaver's and Zimmon is right. Getting those guys as your edge rushers would be a nice one, two combo. Now, one guy I want to see them avoid is Kayvon Lachazen. I hope I said his name correctly from LSU. Cause he, to me is just too damn erratic and he's just too inconsistent. And there's just certain guys like at the next level, there's no way that that inconsistency goes away. Yeah. And let me quickly play devil's advocate here. I don't think the chase young dream is dead just yet. I think this two attack of Iloa declaring for the draft really opens up a, a, a nice scenario here. It opens up a door for the Giants to maybe land Chase Young because we'll assume number one overall is Joe Burrow to the Bengals. 
But then number two overall, a lot of people are pegging Chase Young in that slot to the Washington Redskins. But don't get too ahead of yourselves. Now that Tua Tagovailoa is in this draft, they could end up trading down for a team that needs a quarterback. You might want to jump all the way up to number two in order to secure Tua. And that could be the Dolphins. They're, they're only at number five. It's not that big of a jump to number two. So we could see teams trade down at two and maybe even three. The Lions might make a trade down, too. And, you know, Justin Herbert, if he has a nice combine, it could go quarterback one, two, three, and then number four to the Giants. Chase Young, there's a chance he falls right in our laps. And that's the dream scenario I'm going to be hoping for all offseason. Yeah, and it's just so those are some excellent points that you just laid out right there. And it's certainly it just like, look, the board every single year can fall in a million different ways. Mm -hmm. And I know like so here's the thing I'm involved somewhat on Redskins Twitter and you know like I follow a couple of Redskins guys and you know sometimes like they'll like or retweet something that pops up on your timeline. It's like Redskins fans are like, yeah, firmly pencil in Chase Young at number two overall. And it's like, well hold off on. I think like you're right. You do have to kind of hold off on it because the draft's like three months away at this point and you don't know mm -hmm. what's gonna happen. And like yeah, Chase Young I think would look awesome in um, you know, a Giants uniform and that would actually give getting a guy like Chase Young an impact player would give the Giants offense some extra time to kind of uh, build itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah and then you could focus on offensive tackle or wide receiver with that second round pick that we were just talking about so it would be the ideal scenario obviously to land Chase Young but you know if we're assuming like most people are that Chase Young is out of the picture there's many possibilities that they can go with the second round pick. And you mentioned some talented edge, edge rushers to get in the second round there too. Yeah. And I think that's, um, you know, even that second round, like, look, I think you could also trade down and land like an extra, you know, you're probably not going to land a third round pick if you trade down a couple spots because the value on NFL draft charts just does not add up that way. But then you could end up landing like an extra fourth or a fifth or even a sixth rounder, you know, if you significantly were to trade down and then get some 2021 capital. And I think that's always the benefit mm -hmm. of kind of having a high pick is that there are going to be teams that are going to identify a player that will be well out of their range or they think are going to be off their board by the time they get by the time they're on the clock. And so then that's, you know, you can kind of, you basically hold the cards at that point. You're like, yeah, you know what? We can trade back for this guy. And um, we can trade back with this team and accumulate like extra, you know, fourth or fifth round draft picks, which honestly, if you do your homework on all the prospects that end up declaring, like end up going a much longer way than people think. Yeah. And for the reasons that you just uh, mentioned is why I think that if Chase Young isn't there, um, Trading down really is the best option for the Giants at number four and maybe even at number 36. I think just accumulating a lot of draft capital, getting as much as you can out of this draft class that has a lot of talent really deep at certain positions like wide receiver. This is also why we have such a gripe with that Leonard Williams trade, how we are now missing a third round pick. There's going to be talented players available in the third round, in the fourth round, in this draft class in particular. And I do think that trading back is the best strategy for the Giants this year. But it is something that Dave Gettleman has never done in the first round. So, like, let's just assume, you know, you're a big fan of them trading down. How many, and they're at fourth overall, right? How many spots would you like them to uh, trade down? And if, in fact, they do trade down, like, what player would you want to draft at that spot? Well, I think definitely you're going to be looking at the teams that have multiple first-round picks. Uh, you're going to look to the Dolphins. Uh, they have five, and then they've got a couple picks in the 20s that aren't determined yet because of playoff teams. But you definitely want to look to see if you can get multiple first-round picks to move backwards. Um, also, the Raiders have two first-round picks, and you would be going all the way back to 12. And I don't think that's a bad spot to go to. I think you can still land a talented player possibly Isaiah Simmons, C.D. Lamb, some really great impact players. You can definitely get an offensive tackle at 12. So I think that's about as far back as I would go, uh, considering that you would also be getting a pick at 19 for that too. Yeah, and, you know, that's uh, interesting because I know for a fact last year John Gruden was trying to trade up to get mm -hmm. Kyler Murray, right? Now, here's the thing. I think let's just assume you trade back with the Raiders, right? 
And you get those two first rounders in the process, 12 and 19. I think that's a prime spot. Now, I'm not sure if Isaiah Simmons is going to be on the board, mm-hmm. but um, or even Jerry Judy, right? But I think that even if you get a guy like Henry Ruggs from Alabama, for example, right. as a wide receiver, and then you end up getting somebody like, you know, Tristan Wirfs from Iowa, who mm-hmm. I know has not declared yet, but there's still about 11 days to go until the deadline for underclassmen to declare, or you end up adding like a defensive back. You know, I think that um, those are going to be like, those are going to be two big needs that uh, you would really hit on. Now, granted, I think if you're also at, if you decide to just stand pat at four and you get Jeffrey Okuda in, that just falls into your laps. I think that's a great uh, trade as well. Or sorry, that'd be a great acquisition as well. Yeah, definitely. And like we said, there's a lot of talent in this first round, but that's why also I think you get as many first round picks as you can. Uh, I think the Dolphins are in an excellent spot. They've got a top five pick and then two other first round picks. I think the Dolphins really are building the team the right way. They've got they're going to have a lot of young talent coming in this year, and they're going to be able to progress it. And they're building a really strong foundation. And I wish that the Giants would take note of that and maybe try to do something similar. And that's why I think get as many first round picks as you can, and get as many young talented players as you can. Yeah, and you know Miami's interesting because like our friends. Um... Chad and Luis over at the Dolphins brawl, they mentioned that Miami's got like, I think it's like 14 draft picks this year, which is, I think the most I've ever seen in recent years, but like Miami, you know, they, they would be a prime trading partner, not just one time in the draft, but I think a second time too, because, you know, all 14 of your guys, all 14 of those draft picks probably are not going to be like, future starters for you you know because that rarely happens you don't find 14 like starters in one draft i think that uh, if you trade back with miami like once or even twice both teams are gonna get like an equal share of the pie here because the giants they get some of those extra draft picks while the dolphins get to trade up and you know potentially get some uh impact players that will help build their core yeah, and of course the Dolphins are going to be looking for a quarterback, and obviously that is the most important position in all of sports. And you know, taking an average quarterback and then a, you know a superstar quarterback, the difference is huge. What it can do for a team. So you know, exactly they can get an um, an equal share of the pie because even if the Giants do get more starters and the Dolphins can acquire their starting quarterback, it makes it, it makes it an even split. Yeah, definitely, you know, and um, I know we've got the uh, national championship game for college football coming up in a couple days Mm -hmm. here, and it's going to be like, you know, two super talented teams. It's, you know, LSU versus Clemson. I think that both of those teams, right, there's a couple guys that uh, you absolutely need to know in terms of draft. Like we mentioned Simmons, the linebacker from Clemson. Like he's a guy that, um, you know, obviously you got to keep, an eye on but then there's just other players that uh, i really think would tremendously interest the giants like christian christian fulton right the uh Mm -hmm. cornerback from lsu i think he's an interesting player because i think that he's a guy that could really complement a um guy like deandre baker well it would actually walk into the room and end up being the number one corner right away because he's just fulton's just a great man cover corner right that i think would thrive in terms of whoever the next um defensive coordinator would be yeah and grant delpit is another name you can throw in there playing in the championship game uh the safety at lsu you know the giants they do have a couple nice safeties but you can always look to improve um obviously jabril peppers is a little bit of a question mark we think that he's really going to just settle into his role as a box safety not sure how much he's going to provide in coverage and while i think that julian love has the tools to be a pretty solid coverage safety he's also a fourth round pick so there's question marks there and then also in the second round Potentially, there's some receivers that we can look at. Um, You got T. Higgins at Clemson. You got Justin Jefferson at LSU. So those are two names to definitely keep an eye on for the Giants with the 36th overall pick. Yeah, and you know, I know a moment ago we just talked about sort of trading back with the Raiders and getting their 12th and 19th pick. I think that if you make that, if you go ahead and trade down because you just bought Grant Delpit up, I think that would be a phenomenal uh, guy to pick if he's 
phenomenal guy at number 12 overall to straight up just get would like you said be grant delpit because the thing is is i think like he kind of reminds me a bit of like derwin james coming out of uh florida state a couple years ago and i think you get a guy like that on the back end like that's going to be great because you have an unquestioned leader of your secondary because Delpit's shown he can be an impact player in college. And when he suits up one last time on Monday night, you're going to see, I think him have a great game and it's going to be awesome to see him kind of like go at Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. And a player like a Derwin James, a Jamal Adams or a Grant Delpit, those players really can change your defense because of the versatility that they have. They can play in the box linebacker, they can play deep safety, they can even line up at slot cornerback, and you can plug that player all over your defense and just overall makes your defense a lot better. So that's definitely a name to key in on. And, you know, another player that you can look at in a similar fashion is Isaiah Simmons because that's a lot of what he did in college. He lined up a lot at safety, at cornerback, and linebacker. I wish we did get to see him play more linebacker because I feel like he was lined up at slot cornerback a lot. But he's one of those players that obviously he's going to be bulking up and getting bigger for um, the NFL so he can play linebacker. But he's always going to have those great coverage abilities. And he's someone that you can definitely move around the defense and create some uh, disguised looks and maximize his talents with. Yeah, and you, you mentioned just um, all the attributes that a guy like Grant Delpit would kind of bring to the table. And I think that the more and more I think about it, like with hiring Joe Judge and him basically saying, look, you know, we're going to figure out what the strengths of our players are. I think Mm -hmm. that, um, and play them according to that. I think that Delpit would be probably like a, he'd be a phenomenal fit, right? Especially when you pair him up with a smart guy like Joe Judge, because Delpit can honestly, like you said, transform a defense and take it to another level. Yeah, definitely, and especially if, if what Joe Judge says um, said holds true and he really is going to maximize what players are best at and try to keep them from doing the things that they aren't so good at, yeah, you definitely want these versatile players like Grant Delp and Isaiah Simmons on your defense. Yeah, you know, so the drafts, honestly, I think, like, we know it's three months away, but um, it's going to be, you know, super interesting. Once we do get, like, the full order here in a couple weeks, it's going to be fun to see, like, you know, just how the board falls. And there's like a million different possibilities, right, that um, legitimately could go. But like in the scenario that um, they miss out on Grant Delpit, right, I think like another SEC safety that would be a really interesting fit that kind of gives me some like Minka Fitzpatrick vibes is Alabama's Xavier McKinney. I think like versatility, you know, he's versatile. He can... Excellent in man-to-man coverage. And then he's also a guy that uh, you can play, like, single high safety with. You can have him blitz, too. So I think, like, McKinney's another guy that uh, we should all be keeping an eye on. Yeah, and um, the, definitely the thing to, to think about when uh, looking at safeties or, you know, uh, with this draft class and with this team, safety might not be one of our biggest positions of need, but that's not necessarily important. You really want to find the most talented players because – you know, you might have some solid players that could turn into something with uh, Julian Love and Jabril Peppers, but if you can get a really talented safety and then you can move, you know, Jabril Peppers into another role, that's what you have to do because you can't hold yourself back by just drafting for position. You got to draft by talent. And, you know, sometimes you find a perfect world where talent and position of need meet. And then, you know, that would be like Chase Young. That would be perfect, but it, it can't always be that way and definitely have to look at the most talented player on the board. Yeah, and, you know, it's 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 going to be fun to see, right? But, like, one thing that, um, you know, I think, like, we've excess, sorry, discussed extensively, like, the draft and how we want the board to fall. But, you know, what comes before the draft starts like the second or third week of March is obviously free agency. And I think like free agency, it's going to provide the Giants another chance to kind of add talent to the roster. I know like in the past we've kind of been like, yeah, you know, um, Gettleman just going to throw a uh, big contract at someone. But like I think when you also look at it, like this is a really deep free agency class coming up, especially at certain positions that the Giants need to target. Like, for example, one of the guys that I think could be a good target for the Giants would be 
Saints offensive lineman Andres Pete, another guy that you look at like on the defensive side of the ball, would um, be someone like, and obviously we're just throwing hypotheticals out there, but like you talked about in Ngakwe, uh, mm-hmm. Jadavian Clowney's a free agent. I believe Everson Griffin's a free agent too. And so, you know, some of these guys, right, I think the Giants have a legitimate chance at getting them. Yeah, there's a lot of big names that are about to hit free agency this offseason. And, you know, I'm very um, skeptical about free agency in general, just, you know, throwing a lot of cap space at players who, you know, they're, they're hitting free agency for a reason most of the time. And um, one of the players that, you know, I'm definitely going to keep an eye on is Jack Conklin um, from the Tennessee Titans. I definitely think that he can be, you know, a really solid offensive tackle for the Giants. But I am definitely nervous about the fact of, you know, overspending on another offensive tackle like we did with Nate Solder. But luckily, Conklin is a lot younger than Solder was when we signed him. So that's definitely a player I want the Giants to go after. Yeah, and, you know, I think the biggest thing that um, is going to play kind of a um, factor here, it's without a doubt it's going to be Conklin's price tag because you're getting a guy that was a first-round pick back in 2016. This was a top-10 guy, too. And I think when you look at him, right, like – he, I think, could potentially end up getting money, right? Similar to, like, what some of the best left tackles in the game, like Lane Johnson or Lyle Collins, ended up signing for. And when you just try to play around with the numbers, like, there's a very legitimate chance that he could be making, like, potentially 13, 14, or even, like, 15 million a year, you know, which, like, kind of worries me um, because you don't know if he's going to be the same guy under Joe Judge. Because that's just what happens sometimes. It's like a player will go to, player will excel on one team, secure the bag in free agency, and then end up going to another team. And because of different coaching and schemes, et cetera, all that kind of stuff, different culture and environment, just like end up not being the same player. Yeah, that's why I'm definitely skeptical about really offensive linemen in general, like in particular in free agency, because you don't want to pay premium money for average talent which is what just happened with Nate Solder. And, you know, that really applies to almost every position out there. You know, there are players, Yannick Ngakwe has done great in Jacksonville, but it could also be because he was in a great 4-3 defensive scheme with a lot of other talented pieces around him. There's not a lot of talent on the Giants roster. We don't know what scheme Joe Judge is going to be running, but if it happens to be 3-4 again, it's kind of uh, interesting because we don't really know how Yannick would fit in that scheme. Uh, obviously, he would have to be a stand-up ed- edge rusher, but we we haven't seen too much of that from him. And so, you know, it's really going to be predicated on what type of scheme the Giants want to run and how these players are going to fit. And, you know, we can't get our expectations too high because they might end up performing a lot, uh, a lot worse than they did on their previous teams. Yeah, right. And, and, you know, there's, like, look, right? So I think when you look at some of the lists of, like, free agents, I mean, honestly— the only, like, surefire, I guess, like, guy that I would want the Giants to sign right now that I think would absolutely pan out would probably end up being Jadavian Clowney. I think, like, the guy's shown that he can impact the game no matter what, and he's one of the best at his position. And so if you get a guy like Clowney, that's great. Another guy, like, Here's the thing. So I'm wary of Conklin on the offensive side of the ball. But, like, also on the defensive side of the ball, another guy that I would want to see them just straight up avoid would be Dante Fowler Jr. Now, the guy, the the, the reason being is this. is just like, look, this is a guy that was a top three pick back in 2015. And then he was traded to the Rams halfway um, between the 2018 season from Jacksonville, goes to L.A., and then signs like a one-year kind of prove-it deal because he was like, yeah, I'm going to come back in 2019. I'm bet on myself and have a big year. And he had like a pretty decent year, but um, not the type where it's like, you know what, you can pay this guy big money. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. Dante Fowler Jr. is a name to avoid. Um, Just too inconsistent. You really don't know what you're going to be paying for, and that's a risk that the Giants just can't afford to take at this point. But another big name that's that should hit free agency because this team is um, they're they're coming up tight against the cap with a, a lot of big names that they have to pay is Byron Jones. We should see him hit free agency. Obviously, the Cowboys they have to pay Amari Cooper, they have to pay Dak Prescott, they just paid Ezekiel Elliott. 
Byron Jones is one of those players that could end up being someone they have to just let walk. And, you know, that's a great young cornerback at 27 years old that the Giants should look into. Um, you know, even the cornerbacks that we did pay a lot for, Janoris Jenkins, uh, Dominique rogers Camardi, we paid a lot for these guys, and they didn't necessarily make it to the end of their contracts. But, you know, even the years that they were on the team for, they were really impact players. They they even made all pro teams for us. And Byron Jones really could have a similar impact at 27 years old, and especially on a team that's got a really big question mark at cornerback with DeAndre Baker. You know, he's kind of the future of this unit, and we really haven't seen enough to invest that much stock into him. So Byron Jones is one of my top targets. Let's take that guy away from the Cowboys and put him on our team, make our divisional opponent worse, and make us better. Yeah, and speaking of the Cowboys, I know they just hired Mike McCarthy, right? So Mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting to see the way he does things there because, like, McCarthy right now may be the most experienced coach in the NFC East, but um, you have no idea how things are going to work out in Dallas, especially considering, like, the job in Dallas is always going to be predicated on what Jerry Jones wants, right? But, um, you know, Byron Jones, I think, would be another excellent option, even if you can't get, like, Byron Jones, for example, I mean, another guy to, I think, like kind of poach away from the division or from a division rival, right, would be someone like Ronald Darby, for example, like that wouldn't be an overly terrible consolation prize. I think when Darby's been healthy, he's been great. I think another guy go to the AFC, right? Another like really interesting name that um, I think you could certainly look at and get for a pretty cheap price would probably Daryl Worley from Las, the Las Vegas Raiders because they're moving to Vegas in a few months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I'll add another name to that list in the NFC. Over at safety is Anthony Harris for the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, he's 28 years old, so probably wouldn't be a long-term deal. But, you know, that's a player who's played. He's he's shown some all-pro, you know, flashes. He's shown great potential and has had some really good games and a great season this year with the Minnesota Vikings. And that's a player that, you know, maybe you could get him at safety and free agency and not have to worry so much about that in the draft potentially. Right, and especially considering, I think, like, Harris is, I think, a wild card, right, that uh, you absolutely need to look into signing because if you look at the way the safety market's going to kind of line up this year. So Devin McCourtney's 33 years old. You don't know whether he's going to be back with the Patriots or not, but uh, just with the direction the Giants are trending in terms of building a younger roster, I think you avoid McCourtney. Same thing with Rodney McLeod. Um, avoid him because he's also 30 years old. And guys like Jimmy Ward, Tavon Wilson, uh, not really guys I would sign. Same with, like, Trey Boston, Nate Ebner. But, like, two guys that I think are only, you know, a, like, they're basically the same age, or three really, I think, that could be interesting fits would be Carl Joseph, Ha, Clinton Dix, and like you mentioned, Anthony Harris. And I think for Anthony Harris, like Minnesota does have one of the deeper secondaries in football. So Harris could potentially be the odd man out because they're going to have some of their own contract extensions that uh, they're going to begin have to hand out this season or after their season's over. So I think like Harris would be a great fit then. Yeah, and we, we, you mentioned a lot of the, um, the youth players because obviously this is a young rebuilding team and youth is important. Uh, but one of the veteran players that I think the Giants should look into, and I assume now with Joe Judge as the head coach they will, is Kyle Van Noy. Uh, what a versatile player he is for the New England Patriots. Uh, he really does it all. He, um, he's excellent against the run, and the way that they schemed him into getting a lot of big pressures and nice pass rushing snaps was excellent, and I'm, I'm sure Joe Judge has a great understanding of how Kyle Van Noy works and how to scheme him up. So that's a player, that a veteran player, 29 years old, that I think would really do wonders for the Giants' defense. Yeah, and you, so you mentioned Van Noy, and then I think like another guy that's kind of similar to Van Noy and what he does and is also a free agent that I think would really be a great fit would be Chicago Bears middle linebacker Nick Kwiatkowski. I mean, this is a guy that was a fourth round pick back in 2016, but um, was basically a backup for his first three years. But when he did play, he showed tons of potential, tough physical player. 
uh, brings really a killer mindset to the position, is an excellent asset when asked to blitz. I know that his speed's a liability, so like offensive coordinators will target that all day, but really a guy that I think you can put as like put in at like the Mike or Sam position and then get dividends. And I think that he's the type of player it's like he's not gonna cost you like, you know, all the money in the world, but um, you know, he's going to cost like, I want to say like six or 7 million a year, but uh, I think the return on investment will definitely be worth it. Yeah. And you definitely do want to see the giants, um, you know, get a lot of solid players for a lower price because we really don't need to be over the cap with this team. Uh, We're not a year away from being contenders. We're, we're a couple years away. And so, You don't want to see too many big lucrative contracts being thrown around because that's like throwing a bandage on a broken bone. You got to try to build through the draft and just get solid contributors in free agency. Maybe one at the max two splash pickups in free agency, but I don't want to see them throw too much money around. Yeah, you know, you mentioned like the cap space. So, I mean, over the cap.com's got them at like 64.5 million. Um, now certainly they could make like a lot of different moves and whatnot and kind of, uh, you know, really go ahead and have almost like 70 to even about like 70 million, 80 million in cap space. I mean, we've talked so much about like guys that they want to bring in, but, uh, now I think when you also look at it, it's only fair to talk about guys that, uh, I think they need to get rid of. And I think the one guy that's gotta go i know we've said nate solder because cutting him before june 1st would save six and a half million even though there'd be when this would suck there'd be 13 million dollars in dead cap but i think if Mm. there's one veteran here is there's one vet you're gonna cut right it's got to be alec ogletree because he's only gonna have like three and a half million in dead money but uh he's gonna end up saving you know he'll save you about 8.25 million dollars which i think like that would go kind of a long way towards you know, figuring out what they would want to do, what the Giants would want to do in the draft. Yeah, Alec Ogletree is a player that I think the Giants, they should cut as soon as they possibly can. And I I do think now they will because um, I heard Joe Judge during his uh, press conference today discuss tackling and how fundamental tackling is really important. And when he looks at statistics and tries to relate that to the player's talents, um, he doesn't look at the number of tackles that you have in a season because that's really not a telling statistic. He, he looks at yards after catch in your zone because that, he said, tells him whether the player is in the correct position to make a play and make that tackle. And Alec Ogletree is definitely one of those guys that has allowed a lot of yards in coverage and has been out of position for a lot of tackles. He might have a large tackle number, like high volume of tackles, but he definitely has missed a lot of tackles and been out of position and given up a lot of big plays and coverage. I definitely remember Amir Abdullah in the preseason burning him really badly for the Lions. And yeah, that's one of the players I think the Giants have to cut ASAP. And a couple other players I'll say uh, lesser known might end up getting cut would be Rhett Ellison and Kareem Martin. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned that um, quote from Joe Judge about the tackling and kind of what he emphasized. So I found, you know, I just dug this quote up, and it says that, uh, you know, there's a couple things that Joe Judge kind of wants his the Giants to be. He says, blue collar, hard work old school physicals and saying that the team's going to practice in pads and practice live tackling. And you know what? The emphasis that this guy's going to put on tackling, I think is just awesome because it's like, the thing is, is that uh, we've seen so many teams, right? What ends up happening is it's like, they've got great defenses. Like the 2019 Chicago bears were an example of it. Talented defense, but they couldn't tackle, and as a result, like opponents were just able to score really easily on them. And great tackling, I think, is really one of the foundations of uh, great football, great defensive football. Yeah, it definitely is. And, you know, Joe Judge made it really clear that he cares a lot about fundamentals and the basics and being a textbook football team. And, you know, that's really important. He, he said that he wants the players to practice in pads during the season because he wants them to learn how to tackle properly because that leads to tackling safely. 
He doesn't think that it's going to lead to injuries during the season because if you know how to tackle, you're not going to get hurt. If you don't know how to tackle, that's how you do end up getting hurt. And, you know, that's like that's music to all Giants fans' ears. This guy means business. He wants to get these players in pads, and he wants to toughen them up and teach them how to play football from the basics. So, like, you know, just got to ask you real quick, though. What are your kind of expectations for uh, Joe Judge going into year one? Because, like, this guy blew the press conference out of the water, right? And so with that comes, like, lofty expectations now. And even though you know the team probably isn't going to be competing for a uh, playoff spot in 2020, unless they have an offseason that just, you know, knocks it out of the park, right? What are you looking for for Judge in year one? So what I'm looking for is it's I don't expect this to be another a good year for the Giants. I expect it to be another bad one. They probably won't win a whole lot of games, but there's a difference between Pat Shermer losing 12 games a season and Brian Flores losing 11 games a season because when you listen to the Dolphins players and head coaches and coaching staff, the way that they talk and the way that they discuss the culture that they're building has a totally different feel than the way that Pat Shermer would talk, where he really wasn't taking accountability for anything. He said there's work behind the scenes, and none of it was showing up on the field. But the Dolphins, they've made coaching staff changes midseason. As soon as the season ended, they fired this guy and that guy. They benched players when they weren't playing well. I'm really looking for that culture, and I know that's a, a word that's really overused, but it's something the Giants really lack, and Joe Judge made a point in his press conference to say he's going to instill a winning culture, and that's what I want to see. Even if we are losing a lot of games, fans aren't – they were not connecting with Pat Shermer and the way he would talk to the reporters after the games. But with the way that Joe Judge spoke to the reporters in his introductory press conference, that's what I'm looking for from him is to see if he can keep that mindset and keep all of these fans united the way that they were today in the season when things get tough. When the going gets rough, let's hear Joe Judge be our voice. Let's hear him instill our confidence and keep some unity in the fan base and amongst the players so we can feel confident about what's coming ahead in the coming years and not be so wrapped up in how bad things are currently. Yeah, you know, I think that a lot of um, – I totally agree with what you said there because it's like as a young – you know, the first thing you got to do kind of with a young team is just – Besides teaching them how to win in the NFL, you also got to be able to go ahead and uh, instill tons of confidence in them. And they need to be buying into your vision from day one. Otherwise, like, it's very hard to, like, see it working out. But and, and, you know, the thing is, the head coach isn't the only one that can go ahead and kind of make or instill a culture, you know, and do all the work. I think, like, you also have to surround yourself with smart assistants that are going to be willing to go ahead and to, you know, really instill culture. you got to have a coaching staff around you, be it coordinators, position coaches, assistant coaches that are on the same page as you all the time. And I think, like, how Judge builds his staff is really going to go a long way. And one of the guys that's been floated around would um, be former Browns head coach Freddie Kitchens. Yeah, I'm really happy you mentioned the assistant coaches because Joe Judge did as well, and he he expressed how important he believes a strong coaching staff to be. And that's really, I think that's very important and encouraging to hear him say. And, yeah, Freddie Kitchens has been brought up. Um, Joe Judge and Freddie Kitchens have a connection because they both coached at uh, Mississippi State many years ago, I think in 2005. And, you know, Freddie Kitchens is kind of a polarizing name. There's going to be a lot of fans who are going to be against this, but I think you got to um, you got to try to look at it from two angles. You, you can look at it as a major failure at head coach for the Browns this year, and that he was, but I really don't think that was fair for him. He was put in a position where – you know, he just wasn't ready to be a head coach. He got the job, and they had better candidates, but they decided to give it to Freddie Kitchens, and that was just a bad hiring by the Browns. They've been a mess for years, and they still are. They still don't even have a head coach uh, heading into, you know, three weeks now without one. And, um, you know, Freddie Kitchens, I think if you look at 2018, you isolate 2019, yeah, bad head coaching season. But in 2018, you know, there was a lot of players on that team that bought into him. Uh, Baker Mayfield did. He really did well under Freddie Kitchens in his rookie season. He was a runner-up for Offensive Rookie of the Year. And I think that he got the most out of Baker Mayfield that year. And I believe that, you know, he's got uh, 
you know, a background as a running backs coach. He's been a wide receivers coach before. He's coached some pretty solid players. And I really, I wouldn't hate the hiring as much as everybody else, as long as he's not actually the offensive coordinator. I think that's too big of a role for him. But as a position coach, someone with head coach experience, which I think is very important for a first time head coach like Joe Judge to have, have assistance with head coaching experience. I think Freddie Kitchens could be a pretty good hiring. Yeah, you know, and uh, I know that uh, before we jumped on here, I was like, yeah, they shouldn't hire Freddie Kitchen just because kind of like all those like red flags you just mentioned that would Mm -hmm. obviously come with him. I mean, look, here's the thing, right? When he got the head coaching job in Cleveland, I straight up told people the moment they named him head coach, I was like, this is not going to work out just because you – don't make the jump, right? It's very rare that there's a candidate, right, that makes a jump from being a position coach to being a, um, you know, head coach all of a sudden. And I know the same thing just happened with Joe Judge, but there's a difference is that Judge was in a far more stable situation and came out from day one and impressed in his press conference. Kitchens did not do that. Here's the thing. You and this is why I don't like Freddie, right? Because kind of the inexperience. I agree with you on that. I don't want to see him be an offensive coordinator. But like I know when he worked with Joe Judge, he was the tight ends coach in 2004 at Mississippi State. I mean, or at Mississippi State, was the running back running backs coach in Cleveland. And I think that if you get this, was also a quarterbacks coach too, right? Worked with guys like Carson Palmer. Now I think that um. What you do is you bring this guy in and you need to figure out like where he's going to fit best because he's coached tight ends, he's coached running backs, he's coached quarterbacks as well, right? But like where is the ideal fit for him on a rebuilding team? And I think right now it would obviously end up being the um, quarterback position or the quarterbacks or running backs coach, one of those two, because you'd be working with uh, Daniel Jones or – with Saquon Barkley. And I think that let's just say he gets the quarterback position, right? Or the, Oh my God. I've said that a million times. I cannot believe it. But anyway, let's just say he gets the um, quarterback coach job, right? I think that he'll do a pretty good job because he kind of did, um, you know, take Baker's game to another level in Baker's rookie season, even though he was the offensive coordinator. Yeah. And I don't know if I would want him to be the quarterback's coach. I think that's that's a spot that you really you got to you got to find the right guy for that. That's an important coaching job. Um and so I'm not really necessarily sure who I want the Giants to put there and I I'm really not against them keeping who they currently have there. I I'm forgetting his name, but we saw a great progression from Daniel Jones in his rookie season. So if there is a position coach on this team that you want to keep, I know that they kept Thomas McGahey, the special teams coordinator, but you might want to keep that quarterback's coach around too, just to have continuity for Daniel Jones. You don't want to, uh, you know, stunt his growth by implementing a whole new system. Maybe keep some uh, pieces from the last regime in there at the quarterback spot. And um, Freddie Kitchens, I think one thing about the Cleveland Browns is Their running backs have done a tremendous job the past two years. Nick Chubb, uh, Kareem Hunt, uh, even Duke Johnson had good games. You know, they've had some really great players in that backfield. So I I wouldn't mind Freddie Kitchens being the running backs coach for the Giants and seeing if he can help Saquon reach the the next level. Yeah, and, you know, you mentioned, um, I believe the quarterbacks coach, right, Sean Ryan. I think that's, um, and you mentioned Daniel Jones, too. And so I think Sean Ryan and... Daniel Jones like they've obviously got a pretty good relationship right um and so the thing is right is that um I think if you add you know you keep Sean Ryan around and I think that that would actually be the right move because Sean Ryan would kind of give Joe Judge insight on Daniel Jones that uh you would not get where you to just like straight up start over. And I really agree with that continuity aspect. And one of the things that I think will really be interesting to see just throughout the off season, OTAs, mini camps, and then what, even once they get to training camp in uh, late July, is that relationship between judge and Jones? Like how does that grow? Yeah, I will say, um, I know you mentioned Sean Ryan. That's the quarterback's coach of the Detroit lions. He used to serve as the giants quarterback's coach years ago. But he then went to Houston, and then 
he he's actually someone that's in line to be the offensive coordinator for the Carolina Panthers now with Matt Rule. They have a great relationship. I believe it's actually Mike Shula serving as the Giants quarterbacks coach right now, uh, but he's also serving as the offensive coordinator. I think you don't want him to be the offensive coordinator because he doesn't call plays. Maybe just keep him as the quarterbacks coach, though, and then find the legitimate offensive coordinator to put in his place there. That's something that I think would be great. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I just looked it up. I mean, they don't even have a uh, quarterbacks coach right yeah. now. So that's going to be interesting. I believe it's Mike Shula working both of those jobs as offensive mm-hmm. coordinator and quarterbacks yep. coach. Anyway, so before we get out of here, as always, be sure you're checking out our Fanatics link. Um, www.thebearsbrawl.com backslash fanatics. There's tons of deals on there. And also, Anthony was super fired up about this. We also just launched our very own uh, merchandise line for the podcast. So we're here to help you guys redo your wardrobe and get ready for 2020. So... You can go on Design Tree. I tweeted the link out from the social media account. Um, or sorry, from the Twitter account, rather. We got, like, awesome shirts, guys, available in all types of Giants colors. Like, you know, got the red, the white, the gray, and also uh, blue. You can also check out the hoodies we've got because winter's still here for, like, another three or four months. And, uh, yeah, you know, just stay warm. But, uh, Anthony, do you want to add anything before we get out of here? Yeah, definitely go check out the merch. I think, you know, our I love the logo. I think they look really good. The t-shirts, I'll be wearing those since I live in Florida and it's a little too hot for a hoodie. But yeah, go check that out. Help support us. Let's grow this brand. And, um, you know, follow us on Twitter. I'm at Anthony underscore Rivardo. Be sure to, you know, hit me up. You know, we'll talk football. We'll have some good debates. If you love Gettleman, if you hate Gettleman, you can hit me up about that. Tell me who you think the Giants should hire as their offensive coordinator. That's something I definitely want to deep uh dig deep into and i'll definitely be talking about in my articles over at empiresportsmedia.com check me out there and of course follow my man who said on twitter as well and follow our uh our podcast account at giants brawl pod and you know check us out let's talk some football yeah definitely you know we're super responsive uh to the giants brawl twitter handles you can add us on there all the time be like hey what'd you say you know i live in the midwest guys so i'm for sure gonna end up getting a uh hoodie just because gotta support the podcast you know i'm wearing this boring gray eddie bauer t-shirt right now Not eddie bauer t-shirt just this long sleeve shirt because it's like 12 degrees and uh windy outside right now so uh you gotta dress warmly but um that's it for this week's episode guys thanks for tuning in thanks for listening um oh yeah by the way before we officially got out of here we also just launched a uh, youtube channel and so you can see us on youtube as well we'll be uploading these recordings each week we got a uh, another uh host that's going to be joining the crew next week but let's officially get anthony let's get out of here because i gotta jump on another podcast after this but uh thanks for tuning in guys we'll see you next time